Okay. All right. I'm assuming everyone can hear me since Dr. Hale can hear me. We're going to get started here. Um, welcome to our webinar. I know these are some strange times. You know, we got to do webinars instead of meeting in person. We'd love to see y'all again, but you know, we're going to manage what we can. What we can. So today's um, presentation is going to be, it's called Periodontal Quick Hitters, a clinical Q&A. So the idea behind this is that, you know, y'all answered a bunch of questions or y'all sent a bunch of questions in via survey and, um, you know, we're here to answer them as best as we can. Uh, so uh, if you, uh, we're going to go. We're going to go through some announcements here. OK, so first off, please mute and turn off your cameras. That's it's going to avoid some distraction here. Um, and uh, if you do have questions while we go through this, uh, you go ahead and submit them through chat through the chat so we can I'll, I'll monitor them and we'll answer them. There's going to be a few spots in between the presentation where we'll stop and answer some questions. So if you have any, go, uh, do it that way for me for us, please. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and the uh, CE credit will be emailed. So uh, and we'll also send the uh, the presentation. So we'll send a power the PowerPoint presentation. You'll get all that within the next few days. All three of those things, the recording link, the uh, credit and uh, the, the presentation. Our next uh, study club date is uh, Thursday, uh, October 22nd. Um, we assume it's going to be another webinar uh, and um, we'll the speakers to be determined. Uh, lastly, uh, I want to thank our sponsor um, Nobel. Joe with Nobel is here uh, with us and helping us hosting this uh, webinar. So we, we couldn't we couldn't have done it without them. So yeah, yeah. appreciate that. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, so uh, so I'm going to just jump right into it here. OK, so uh, one of the first questions we got was how are perioendo lesions identified and treated? So uh, there's a few there's a few different ways to uh, classify these. Uh, the first one here is a and here's a little picture of them. The first one here is a primary endodontic and secondary perio lesion. What that means is that there was a cavity, the uh, the root canal portion of the tooth got infected, and subsequently caused a infection here in the peri in the periodontium. So you have probing depths, but that was caused by the endodontic infection. Uh, the second one here is the the opposite of that. So you have a periodontal infection that causes a infection within the root. So it's a retrograde infection. Uh, this one's not as common, but it can happen. Okay. And lastly, there's a, a true combined lesion. OK, so you still have that caries here. So there's an endodontic lesion and a periodontic lesion that formed um, independently of each other and then connected. So you have those three, uh, those three ways of, of distinguishing them. Uh, the radio, uh, the way that you can diagnose these is you have to you first you need to have a radiograph so you can tell in this uh, radiograph here that there's an infection on the bottom. And uh, and you know you can you see there's there's something going on with that tooth. There's frication bone loss, so you definitely want to probe around these kind of cases so you can see if there's any uh, periodontal involvement. And lastly, you want to do some thermal and percussion testing to assess the the if the tooth's alive. No. Uh, the treatment you know, treatment is going to essentially this is a little flow chart. Essentially, it's going to involve some sort of combination of endodontic and perio treatment. Um, uh, and it, you know, these are a little these kind of cases are a little more complex to treat because there's more than one uh, more than one treatment that needs to be done to it. OK, so that's those are perioendo lesions. So the other the other related type of lesions are vertical root fractures and and that kind of brings us to the next question here. So how are vertical root fractures identified and treated? So vertical root fractures uh, are as they sound. Uh, fractures that essentially go up and down the root in a coronal apical direction. Uh, so you can see here that that is clearly a fracture on that tooth after this the gum tissue has been flapped away. You can see that um, and obviously that that's a tooth that needs to be removed. Here you, on a radiograph you can see that you don't often see it on a radiograph this you know definitively, but you can see there's a, a, a fracture right there on that tooth and you can see that there's some infection in this area on the x-ray. 
So the the diagnosis of vertical root fractures is very similar to uh, very similar to uh, perioendolesion. So you and you need to probe, look at radiographs, do percussion testing, and um, and sometimes it it involves visual confirmation, uh, which will I'll talk about a little bit in the treatment portion of vertical root fractures. So you can see here uh, the one of the big defining factors of vertical root fractures is a J-shaped lesion. So you can kind of see that there's this there's this little J-shaped um, uh, infection around this root here. When in this specific case, it had a fracture on the mesial root. So treatment in treatment in these kind of cases uh, is if if you know for sure it's a vertical if, uh, if you know for sure that it's a fracture, it needs to be taken out. The tooth needs to be extracted. Okay. Sometimes we're unsure. So so when we when we are unsure if it's a fracture or not. We need to do. Uh, we need to have surgical access to uh, surgical access to these teeth. So we'll do. We'll do a flap. We'll we'll remove the infection tissue and see what's going on there. Uh, if there's a fracture, then we'll take it out. And if there is not, then we can attempt something called guided tissue regeneration, which involves bone grafting uh, and trying to regenerate uh, the lost uh, periodontium. Uh, in these kind of cases, we always we always uh, prepare them for a possible extraction. So they're they're prepared for that in case that needs to happen. OK, so that's it for vertical root fractures. Not not too complicated, very relatively simple. But um, you know, those are that, that's kind of the basics of what's involved in vertical root fractures. OK, the next the next thing we're going to talk about uh, here and if we're, I'm, I'm going fast because we want to we want to get through a lot of questions here. We want to answer a lot of your questions. So again, if you have any questions, you can submit them through the chat box. Specific, if you have any specific questions on cases, you can submit them in the chat box. OK. So uh, uh, the next question is, can you discuss the workflow and evaluation of treatment for periodontitis? OK. Oh, I can hear. I can hear some breathing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, um, so the, their, the initial exam for for uh, for us involves is pretty involved. Okay, so first off, we're evaluating their medical history. We're uh, we're looking at their drug allergies, things that are very involved when it comes to periodontal disease, such as tobacco use, diabetes, heart conditions, and really all their medical history. Okay, because a lot of times we sedate patients, we need to know understand their medical history as well. Uh, their chief complaint, what does the, well, it tells me what does the patient think the problem is. Sometimes they don't know there's a problem. They just said, oh, they just told me to come here and have a look at some of my teeth, okay? They have gum disease, you know, and and that's a problem because a lot of times patients don't feel like there's a problem, uh, so they need to understand there is one, okay? And a lot a lot of times they have a, a bad breath is a chief complaint, which, you know, is is a often a sign of, of, of gum disease. Um, we're taking radiographs as needed. Uh, so a lot of times we get them from y'all, so uh, we take we take them if we need it. And the big the biggest component is the is the comprehensive periodal periodontal charting. So we're we're doing probing depth, recession, bleeding on probing. We're detect we're looking uh, for calculus sub and super gingival. Um, we're doing looking for frication involvement, mobility, uh, everything, um, and what that all that tells us is you know what what kind of what what is the prognosis of these teeth are is what we're going to do uh are we going to have good success okay so that those are we're just evaluating those things and seeing we're kind of in our head developing a treatment plan for this patient so when we get to the treatment plan portion okay we we're looking we, we create a periodontal treatment plan first OK, that's that's that we're trying to figure out how to get them in a better spot from the from the gum disease standpoint. And then we talk about restorative treatment options because because a lot of times they're losing teeth uh, and we need to we need to um, discuss how we can rehabilitate their dentition. So if they lose a first molar, we need to know, you know, we need to have that discussion in advance. You know, what, you're going to lose this tooth. How are we going to fix it? OK, and, and we need to talk and I say options because there are, there are several ways to replace missing teeth, which is something we've been through before. Okay. And lastly, we do correspondence. So we send the dentist the letter uh, and um, you know, so they know what plan we have in mind. OK, 
Okay, and treatment options for perio, just very basically, is are it can be divided into two sections: non-surgical and surgical. You know, we have periodontal maintenance, which you know, I mean, we mostly for patients that have had treatment already, and we're just trying to maintain what they what you know maintain them at a good level. And we have scale and root plane, which is non-surgical. You know, there's and we mostly done mostly for patients that are in the four to five millimeter range. Okay, and we have. Um, we have surgical options as well. We can take out we can take out the tooth. You know that they that's say that's the most predictive way to get rid of periodontal disease is just take the tooth out. Okay, can't have periodontal disease around a empty spot. And uh, we can do um, we can do uh, flap and osseous surgery. All right, which I'm going to touch on a little bit. Uh, guided tissue regeneration or uh, what we call LANAP, which is laser assisted new attachment procedures, is a lot of what we do uh, in in our practice. So oh, you want to, you know, osseous surgery is is kind of the classic way we would we treat severe uh, periodontal disease. LANAP is the newish way. I mean, it's not new, but it's newish. OK, and uh, and I'm going to touch on the differences between the two. OK, the both of the goals are the same, though. We want to reduce the pocket so that the patient can maintain it at home. That's that's the really the goal of all periodontal treatment. To get, get it to a place where the patient can keep it clean themselves. OK, and um, as you can see here on this left picture, this is uh, this is what flap. This is what a flap and osseous looks like. OK, we, we, we make an incision here. Uh, we'll flap the we'll flap. We'll move the gums away. This is bone right here for orientation purposes. This is bone. This is uh, subgingival calculus. OK, that brown stuff. And you can see there's a bone defect here. You see that this is normal. This is pretty relatively normal looking, and this is a bone defect. OK, so our goal is to uh, fix this with osseous, uh, is to remove bone and to make it into a way that, again, the patient can keep clean. Here on the right picture, this is this is a, a snapshot of what LANAP looks like. So this is the tip of an NDAG laser, the fiber of fiber of a laser. OK, and uh, that is that is really what that is doing is um, you know what we're doing with that is we're uh, de disinfecting the pocket and it's going to help us clean but dr hale is going to touch on the lasers a little more so i'm not i don't want to i don't want to steal his thunder <laughs> so um so this is kind of what i've just said right now okay but essentially is a lot of words but essentially with the osseous procedure you're we're going to be making cuts with the scalpel I'll be I'll be um, exposing everything and then I'm going to suture everything back. OK, and guided tissue regeneration is kind of a step further. Uh, if if there is if there's an area that we feel that guided tissue regeneration is is a viable option. OK, what that involves is using something uh, human um, human donor bone graft and uh, membrane, which is to protect that bone graft to allow that area to heal. OK, and Again, LANAP is a regenerate. It's supposed to aid in regeneration of the of the periodontion. So, um, so we, it's a lot more comfortable for the patient. Let's put it that way. And that kind of gets me into uh, the pros and cons between osseous and LANAP. Okay. So, as you as you would as you can imagine, the pros of of osseous are the cons of LANAP, and the pros of LANAP are the cons of osseous. Okay. So the biggest the biggest advantage of osseous of flap and osseous surgery is that I can see everything. <laughs> Dr. Solarski says uh, she can hear you breathing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you might want either mute or put the mic or you know the mic or whatever it is. Uh, thank you, Dr. Solarski. <laughs> so. Um, so the pros of access, the pros of osseous is that you can, um, you have a lot of visibility. You can see everything. You can see the roots. You can see the bones. You can see where everything looks like. That which is the downside of LANAP. You know, it's a little more closed. It is op more open than a scalar root planing, but it's a little more closed. That is definitely more closed than the os than osseous. Now the pros of LANAP are that you get less recession in general, less tooth sensitivity, and and again, in general, you don't need any sutures. OK, every now and then we may have to make a clinical decision to put one suture or two. But for the most part, there's a lot less post operative discomfort. Most of my patients after Lynette, they say eh, it didn't even hurt. You know, if, at worst, at worst, it's, it's one or two days. For osseous, it's usually a little longer because it's a lot more invasive. 
And as, as you can see, you're peeling the gum away from the bone, so that all has to come back. Okay. All right, so here's a here's a kind of referral question that was asked. So this is kind of two part question, very similar, but there's basically saying what periodontal pocket would you consider referring to a periodontist, and at what stage of periodontal disease does a periodontist prefer to come in, prefer to become involved? So essentially, what if there's a magic number, what pocket do I refer, and uh, what stage according to the new new uh, periodontal classification, like we talked about last year? Okay. What what would those be? So, if if I had to pick a number, one to ten, I want to say a, a six or greater. Okay, and the reason is is back is backed by backed by backed by a study here. So this study is a is a classic periodontal article that talks about is by Cafesi that talks about calculus removal. So in a one to three millimeter pocket, whether you do non-surgical or surgical, you're gonna about you're gonna clear the you're going to clear the same amount of calculus, OK? But when you look at the four to six millimeter pockets or the greater than six millimeter pocket, the surgical, as you would imagine, has better has better calculus removal than the non-surgical. So what that tells me is, you know, and now I'm not advocating to do surgery on four millimeters, but but, you know, this in combination with other studies tells me that six millimeters, I can't I can't scale and root plane that tooth very well. OK, it's just very hard uh, to do so. And sometimes when you have generalized subgingival calculus, you're not getting accurate probing depths in the first place. So if you see a case of generalized five to six millimeter probing depths or a few isolated areas of six millimeters, then that's that's an area that I would do surgery in. OK, so so I mean, you go ahead and scale a root plane, but if you have areas that are still uh, that still have residual probing depths, that's a, that is a, that is an indication to, to to send it to a periodontist. Okay. And on the second part of that question, the staging. Staging, just to recap very briefly, on stage, the stage one in general is about one to uh, four millimeters or less probing depths. Okay. Stage two is five millimeters or less. So those would be considered mild periodontal disease. Okay. And then stage three and four uh, are, are six millimeters or greater bone, vertical bone loss, vocation involvement. Those are the those are the more complex cases. So, uh, if if you're you know if you're you know time arm around my back and tell me what stage three or four for sure because they're at risk at losing teeth, and um, those those cases need to be surgical cases for sure. Um, so, in general, stage three or four. Okay. Oh, here's here's a good one. What do you what what do you do when a patient refuses to see a periodontist? All right, so um, we get we get this a lot. Get this question a lot, you know. You know, you got you know you got a lot of stubborn patients, and you're you know most if you have stubborn patients. If you have no stubborn patients, then I like to go to your practice. Um, and but it's a common problem because the thing about periodontal disease is that it does not it does not hurt for the most part. Okay, only when it's really bad is when it starts hurting. So for the most so patients, you know, then you know. I mean, what motivates you if you're you broke your arm, you would go to the doctor, but if you sprained it, you might want to just like, you know, let it let it go. OK, so they don't they need to understand that they need to understand what that problem is. And that this is this phrase that we use in our practice daily uh, is that infection in your gum that is eating away at your bone. OK, so it's very simple. It's not 100 percent accurate because bacteria is not eating away at the bone, but the point gets across. OK, sometimes you need to help them understand. So that means demonstration. So one way you can use models, you can use pictures. You can, a really good way is that if you are, if you just probe, if you just probe them and you know where deep, where healthy and disease sites are, what you can do is you can give, hand that patient a mirror so they can look and, and uh, probe a healthy site. OK, if the probe won't go in very far. It won't hurt. It won't bleed. OK, tell them that's a healthy spot. OK, and then that's 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 something that they can identify. Go to their most severe spot, considering they can see that spot. So try to get to a spot they can see and probe it. They'll, you, they'll, you'll see they can see that the probe goes in much farther. You can see that it bleeds and if you and it will hurt, it'll hurt more. 
you might want you can put even put a little more pressure if you want it to really get the drive the drive the point across okay so uh, those those are those are ways to get your patient to have an alliance with your patient so they understand what you're talking about and they need to understand what the consequences are um you know periodontal disease is uh again it, it, i'm gonna say silent, silent killer is not a killer but it, it tooth killer okay and if you could lose you could lose a lot of teeth through periodontal disease if it's not treated okay so so tooth loss is a big deal you know chewing function and replacing the tooth is way more expensive than trying to to maintain it okay so so that's you know you have to they have to understand that as well and if they have other issues in their medical history like diabetes heart disease and the list goes on you can tell them that they have there's a there is a strong link between those between periodontal disease and those other conditions in addition you can get your dentist in the room with you to you know you the more people they hear from the more that it drives home the point and lastly if it really if you really need to and this has happened you know just refuse the cleaning treatment there's a point if they have seven million probing dust everywhere and you're just doing a prophy on them then there's a point it's negligence okay and 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 they you know you know i know it's uncomfortable to to say no we can we won't clean you today but sometimes that that is what needs to be done so it i know it's a hard conversation so but but do your best it's your it's your it's your responsibility to to under to help the help the patient understand what's going on in their mouth you know whether it's the cavity or gum disease or whatever it is okay now this is kind of a hard question for me since dr hale nor dr hale nor i deal with the insurance portion or cost or anything like that but um we did we did uh uh, we did refer to our to our uh, front desk uh, staff because they're way better at this than us. It's a really bad question for us. But what is the insurance coverage these, of these procedures? Now, there's no straight answer, so I'm going to give you a very general answer uh, because it's um, you know it's it's uh, it's not the same for every insurance. So the periodontal procedures, uh, from an insurance perspective, which usually falls under the basic, which is usually 80 percent. Um, which includes scale root planing, periodontal surgery, and soft tissue grafting. Uh, sometimes they fall under major, which is 50%. Um, and implants, they would fall under major if it's covered, it's 50%. Some, a lot of times they aren't covered, as well as, uh, as well as um, uh, uh, the bone grafting and all that. So sometimes they don't cover that. So again, it varies from insurance to insurance. There's no one size fits all, but in general, most periodontal procedures are covered under 80%. Okay. All right. We got any questions? Okay, we got one right here. Let's see what it says. So Marlene says, is there any websites you can recommend where we can find pictures of periodontal disease? So I, I'm not sure if you have to be a member, but the uh, the American Academy, the American Academy of Periodontology does um, it does does do have uh, materials so i think it's www.perio.org and um uh i i can maybe i can maybe upload some of that to our website and but i'll let you know if that if we get that get that to happen okay all right thank you for the question marlene uh dr would you be able to move the mic a little bit yeah that better yeah that's good okay so dr hale is going to take over from here um and uh and talk about some other some some other questions y'all have all right thanks mike it was a great uh, talk here and thanks to everybody for showing up tonight and uh we'll go on without much further ado here uh one of the questions submitted was what are the difference in dental lasers and you can see just from the pictures alone that we have a variety of uh, lasers out there and this is just a few of them so what makes them different uh, one of the things we know that all dental lasers are not alike there's no one perfect laser for every task there is in dentistry so if you're looking for a one one-stop solution you're not going to find it with a laser 
And the reason is that there are several physical factors that determine what that laser will do well. So we're gonna focus in on some here. Uh, the first is uh, wavelength, and that's probably the most important parameter. And then that laser's active medium that produces that particular wavelength. And then after it's produced the laser, what effect on what different type of material? So that's what you call a chromophobe because that's the material that absorbs that light at that specific wavelength. So all of those things in combination are what really makes a difference in your lasers. So just quickly going over what a laser, how it's built, they're all similar. They, they have a pumping mechanism. Basically, that's just a, a light producer. It can be a flashlight. Uh, and it shines it into an active medium. And you can see below that uh, some of the more common dental lasers out there. And you'll notice that the active medium written out beside it there, it can be a gas, crystals, uh, it can be a liquid. And that really determines the wavelength that's going to be produced by that particular uh, laser. So as the light from your pumping mechanism gets into uh, your active medium, it begins to line up all of the light, polarizes it, you know, collimates it, if you will, gets it going all in the same direction, bouncing off mirrors back and forth, and then it comes through another mirror and comes through a, a little port, and it comes out as a laser light, a very intense light at a specific wavelength. And you'll also notice on the right side there, the, the different my, uh, wavelengths that are produced by those active mediums. So you can kind of pick and choose what you need. When we go to the chromophores, what, what do these lasers affect? And so you look at their wavelengths and you can kind of figure out what they do best. So just looking, let's say example, uh, a diode that runs from 820 to about 920. Uh, you can look at that particular wavelength and you see that you know, it, it kind of works with water. It does a little bit to hydroxyapatite. All these are uh, uh, types of materials that are in our area, that, you know, that we're, we're worried about, like hemoglobin and melanin water. Tooth surface hydroxyapatite, you'll see it's not very well absorbed by hydroxyapatite, but somewhat, so you can damage a tooth with it. But mostly darker uh, objects like uh, for instance, hemoglobin or melanin. So your diode works better on pigmented type material. Uh, as opposed to uh, going to another example, looking up at the ERG YAG, that's the ERYSGG at 2790, and look what it's resorbed, what, what absorbs it. And you look at it, it's absorbed better by hydroxyapatite, and it's really resorbed really well by water. So an erg lag, that's a that's a water laze, and you all have heard of bio laze, and you can cut teeth with it. You know, you, you actually can use it to prep teeth because hydroxyapatite is a major chromophore for that particular wavelength and water, and it certainly can cut tissue. It'll cut anything. It'll cut bone, tissue, tissue of all types. It's not very specific. So that's just how basically, you know, just varying what type of laser you have depending on what your goals are. I want to cut teeth. Well, you wouldn't pick a diode or a YAG to do it. You would pick your erbium. So looking at all the lasers, what, what do you use? Uh, a ruby laser. Uh, that's a very low wavelength laser, and that's what you see in a common pointer. That's uh, just like you buy at uh, Office Depot, you know, and point at the sky or whatever. It's a red. Um, but that's also used in dentistry because on your uh, higher end lasers, like an ND YAG, for instance, uh, the YAG, that 1064 wavelength is above visible light. So you can't actually see the laser energy. So they'll add a ruby light to your laser on top of it. So when you see the little red dot at the end of your laser screen, that's actually a ruby, ruby lasers. Uh, showing up, not not your actual working laser wavelength, if you will. So it's used as a visibility um, point. A diode really is a different kind of laser in that it's not really using the laser energy to do cut as much as it is to really heat up 
a glass rod or a, uh, at the end. So it really, you think of a diode as just being a very hot tip. And when I say hot, we're talking really hot, 500 to 2000 degrees centigrade, and that's centigrade. And remember, 100 degrees centigrade is boiling. So you know that that's hot. Uh, an ND YAG, that's like a periolase, it can cut soft tissue. It can actually selectively cut types of tissue. So it can remove epithelium from connective tissue specifically. Not all ND YAGs do that, but, but the periolase does. The ERG, we've already talked about, you can cut tooth, bone, cuts all kinds of soft tissue. It's actually non-contact, so you don't have to touch anything. And it's actually safer around an implant. And why? Because your diode and your ND egg, if we go back, they're really resorbed real well by pigmented things. So darker structures really pick up their wavelength. So, you know, obviously with a dark metal implant, that's going to pick up, that's going to be a major chromophore for an ND egg. We're not so much truth in that for ERG or a CO2 laser. And so, those type lasers are actually much safer to use around an implant. They won't heat that that fixture up. Um, so there's some differences. So again, depending on what you want to do, I want to cut soft tissue. Well, most of them will cut soft tissue. If I want to do it specifically, I might I might look at an ND egg. Um, so one of the questions was, can can you use it with routine hygiene procedures? And, you know, and there's a lot of uh, courses and things out there teaching that, but it, but really it's it would be pretty difficult without anesthesia. You can you can use some lasers a little bit without anesthesia. At least they tell you so. And, and I've done it. You can, but it's not super comfortable. So it'd be difficult without anesthetizing a patient. And then depending on what laser you pick, there's really a a very great risk of imprecise removal of all tissues. So you're not just removing, oh, uh, you know, bad connect, uh, inflamed tissue, you're also damaging healthy tissue right beside it. And if you like pick up an herb, for instance, you can even uh, cut bone and root structure if you're just applying that blindly, uh, blindly into periodontal pocket. So you have to be careful, you know, and pick wisely what you're doing at that point. Um, most dental offices probably have a diode. They're they're relatively inexpensive and they're they're actually fairly useful in a general practice. Um, and there's mo some of you may have more expensive type of lasers, uh, you know, but they run in the range of twenty five thousand to a hundred thousand dollars plus. So there's not a lot of um, uh, dental offices that probably have these lasers, multiple lasers, just laying around to be used. And then going back to the diode, just remember it is just a hot tip and it does lack some of the finer qualities of some of the other wavelengths. Now, and Dr. Wynn has addressed a little bit of can lasers be used in uh, periodontal surgery? And certainly in our office, we do a laser assisted new attachment procedure, LANAP. And uh, we use a, a periolase and it's an ND YAG. And we, you know, but that controlled wavelength and you can selectively remove types of tissues. Uh, ND eggs not as well absorbed by hard tissues. So um, it doesn't cut teeth very efficiently, but if you like anything, if you try, it'll do some damage. So you gotta be careful. And it does promote regeneration as he's mentioned before in disease side. So Basically, it's a 1064 micron laser that's used in a controllable continuous pulsed contact and contact. You actually have to touch the tissue to cut and that allows a minimally invasive periodontal surgery with emphasis on regeneration. I'm going to show you a little video here, kind of what it what it goes about. It takes a few seconds for it to load here. So basically you start out with a uh, fiber optic tip, you put it into the uh, around the pocket and you begin to remove some tissue. And this uh, this removes the inner lining of your uh, sulcus and uh, inflamed tissue. It also will uh, because it is attracted by pigment, it'll kill bacteria. So it's disinfecting while we're in there doing that. It 
it opens up that uh, pocket or relaxes that tissue enough so that now you can get a little better visualization. You can start scaling. You can see the calculus a little better, although it's limited, as, as Dr. Wynn pointed out. So you're cleaning away the calculus, as we all do. And then, uh, and then we're going to go in and take a second laser pass at a different setting. And what we're going to do at this point is kind of finish up the what remains to be done and then begin to actually coagulate the blood clot. Kind of like the old cowboy movie where you slept the hot iron on top of a wound and, and uh, create a clot. And that clot's what's going to bring the healing back into the area right there. So that's fundamentally what we do with uh, LANAP. So we're going to move on to chemotherapeutics because one of the questions that was presented was, is getting a periodontal laser certification worth the investment versus using the, the antibiotics like arrestin or antimicrobials with SRP that's already available to us anyway? And, uh, and the secondary was, if I want to get certified, how do I get there? Well, uh, I went to a CE in San Antonio hosted by the Academy of Laser Dentistry and there were hygienists in there and they give you a certificate. So whatever wavelength they happen to be teaching, you can go to their courses and they'll actually have more of a, a formalized type certification process if you want to. You can go to their website and find out information about that. Millennium, which is the company of Periolase, actually has a dedicated uh, hygiene portion to their uh, program. I actually sent Jenna to that and she's been through that. And then I'm sure other laser companies, if you happen to own different lasers, probably sponsor certification as well. So um, so one of the other questions was how do you how about the use of chemical agents and specifically hydrogen peroxide as antimicrobials? So let's just talk about chemotherapeutics in general. Antimicrobial type chemotherapeutics, it's a very alluring idea. It's superficially effective, but it's so frustrating. They're, they're just not good periodontitis treatments as much as the idea of their use. It, they're great ideas. Golly, I, I put this chemical in this pocket. It kills the bac bacteria that's causing the disease. And um, it sounds like a great idea and it has some merit because they are effective antimicrobials. But it, but unfortunately in the literature, if you look at it, it falls short of expectations and you ask, well, why is that? And it's, it's basically physical. In pockets that are three millimeters or less, uh, you know, we know any type of toothbrush, floss, mouth rinse, they can be effective and reaching into the depths of those pockets. So, you know, a simple gingivitis or just a simple cleaning, you know, they, you don't need any real fancy antimicrobials to do it, but any of them will work. It's when you get into the deeper pockets and it's really because of delivery. Because we have um, fluid that flows through our, our pockets and sulcus that comes from our interstitial tissues around it. So we have fluid flow out of that pocket and even in healthy conditions, that clavicular fluid flows at about, it changes over about 40 times an hour or about every minute and a half. And that flow can increase up to 30 times if you introduce inflammation like you would in periodontal disease. So you literally have a tsunami of fluid flowing against your efforts to try to put an antimicrobial in there. So patient applied any, uh, any um, antimicrobials like that really aren't that efficient. And then you could go to professionally applied. So we're putting the chemicals in. So we're putting a restin in or we're putting, a, <clears throat> I don't care if you want to irrigate with hydrogen peroxide or what, or hexidine or anything, you're, you can force it down into the deeper areas. So you're marginally better than, than a patient applying it. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, uh, those, those materials are quickly diluted because you haven't stopped that flow and they're washed out fairly readily. So you can, you can achieve some soft, soft uh, short-term effects, but long-term you're not gonna find very much effect long-term. So what about 
hydrogen peroxide specifically. And I know this is a busy slide and, and uh, this, these are all reference statements. So if you need a reference on it, you can just contact me and I'll be glad to give you a reference. But um, I just threw up some things to show you the conflicts here. Um, let, look at the first line. It says in hand, the, one of the pros, it enhances wounding healing. And you go over the one, the cons, and it shows it's been shown to interfere with healing. So it produces oxygen and it produces radicals and radicals kill microbes. They break up the DNA. But if you look at the cons, well, free radicals are carcinogenic. So that's not necessarily good. And they also break you down too. So if you've got healthy tissue and you put a, a, a radical on it, it'll break your cell too. So it kills good with bad. Produced by our own body, but only in some very, very small concentrations. Low concentrations, not been shown to cause carcinogen, but uh, other times it shows it causes ulcerations and cancer. And more importantly, right in the lower right corner, no proof that it's more effective than any other mouth rinse to include Listerine or your Sopridium chlorides like Scope and things like or chlorhexidine. So in reality, it's no better than the rest of them. So based on these conflicting studies, what would I recommend to you and what I tell my patients? I do not believe that intermittent use of a 1 to 1.5%, that's either a half or a third of what you get in the brown bottle there, which is a 3% solution, will do you any harm. So if you want to take a good swig of it every once in a while, it's not going to hurt you. Uh, it may do some good, especially if you're dealing with gingivitis. And obviously, we've instituted that based on uh, recommendations from the CDC to as a pre rinse. And so now we're having every one of our patients pre rinse with a 1% a, a solution of um, hydrogen peroxide before we, we work with them for COVID. Um, I would not recommend it for everyday use. Um, it's not more effective than any regular mouth rinse especially for periodontitis patients. And, you know, it doesn't really particularly taste good. So compliance is a real problem with these type of things. Patients, you know, they give up on it pretty readily because they don't like it. Uh, in, in doing some research for this question, I happened to look into Wikipedia. It's so funny, I, uh, I didn't realize, but hydrogen peroxide is, is a fairly volatile compound because as it breaks down, it really produces oxygen. And, uh, it, you know, oxygen burns. And uh, so I read one article that showed that they were using a laser and then using it to heat the uh, hydrogen peroxide up into a sulcus. And I kind of got the idea that that might not be a very good idea because it does, when it heats up, it releases more oxygen. Oxygen being combustible, you could potentially, I think maybe a little over the top, but you could set fire to it. And, and there are uh, real incidents in the OR with using oxygen and uh, lasers and Bovi uh, electrosurges that they've actually set, set the patient's mouth on fire. So it, it's a, it can be a serious problem. And uh, not, to, not to be, and to tell you that you think, oh, that's not, that would never happen to me, but at, at real high concentrations, we're talking 60, 70, 80%, they used it to launch the shuttle. So it, it's it's potent, so be careful. Uh, let's talk about night guards, uh, some indications. Uh, that was a question. Uh, pain in the joints, you know, click pops, grinding on bone, deviation of the jaw, limited opening, less than 35 millimeters. You can uh, put your finger in the ear canal if you're so inclined to do that and have the patient open. That may elicit pain, and that's usually from your joint. Obviously, you can have uh, muscle pain, myofascial pain dysfunction syndrome. So usually it's your masseter or your temporalis. The patient will complain about headaches in their temporal regions. And you've all had patients where you've been scaling a root planing or working on them and their jaw starts to quiver, you know, after just a few minutes. They can barely hold their mouth open. And that may be an indication that they have some uh, myofascial pain problems. Uh, obviously, excessive wear on the teeth, so they're bruxing, they're wearing out their teeth. You see a lot of abfraction, 
So you see a lot of uh, non-carious cervical lesions and a lot of that gets mixed in with recession for the same reason. And then obviously if you have, uh, you know, mobile teeth, maybe those teeth might be mobile and not actually have a lot of bone loss. So you kind of figure, well, what's happening here? And they're just maybe putting excess forces on your teeth. So night guards are really designed to eliminate or alleviate or, or reduce some of those signs and symptoms. And they actually do it by taking your teeth out of what I call the masticatory equation. So you, when you bite, it's really a combination of the harmony between your joints, your muscles of mastication and your teeth. So we know that teeth have hard cusp and fossas. And so when you close your teeth together, uh, you know, your teeth are going to be forced into some uh, eccentric, can be forced into some eccentric position. So that leaves your muscle kind of stretched or your joint out of joint, if you will. And over prolonged periods of time, that'll produce some pain and some, uh, and ultimately some parafunctional habits. So the idea behind a night guard is to take your teeth out of the equation. So you put a piece of plastic in there. And you can substitute a more idealized occlusion that, that takes away those eccentric movements. And so it allows your muscles and your TMJ to kind of relax back into a position. And by that, obviously, you relieve some of the signs and symptoms. At least that's the theory. So you ask, what type of night guard? Well, there's hard, soft, upper versus lower. You can change all kinds of occlusal schemes. You can do full arch versus partial coverage like NTI. Um, there's so many variations in concepts, it's hard to really uh, talk about all of them when we're not. Some points I want to get across, soft night guards really ought to be thrown away. They ought to be out of pharmacies. They ought to be off TV commercials. They're really only a, an emergency temporary solution. So if my patient comes in and they're really in pain, joints are out, you know, they're, they're dying because of their joints and things, then um, you can make it, a, you know, a real down and dirty soft night guard pretty fast, or you can go get one from the pharmacy and that'll get them out of pr uh, trouble long enough for me to get a hard, a hard guard back from the lab at that time. Only choose a mandible if it's more ideal. It really doesn't matter, maxillary or mandible, you can choose either one. But if a patient needs to talk, for instance, or wears it during the daytime, then, then a mandible, you can wear the lower and really talk on the telephone and things without a lot of interference to speech. Or if, uh, you know, it's like that first situation where I had primary occlusal trauma, I have a lot of mobility and I want to splint those teeth together with some type of a removable device. That might be a reason to use a mandible versus a maxilla. Uh, full arch. I really use full arch. When, when I have a joint problem, I know that I, you know, I've got some dysfunction in the joint and that's really what's causing or disturbing uh, our uh, masticatory efforts that the patients are in pain. I, I like full arches for that. Um, you can pick whatever you want to. I usually use cuspid rise and that, not that you care, but, but uh, a full arch. Where I prefer an NDI, NTI, a partial coverage, is when you're really dealing with myofascial pain dysfunction where where you have maybe have a static clinch versus a bruxism where you're moving and you can use it in bruxers too but if they're just clinching straight up and down the problem with soft night, night guards and full arch night guards is that you're really giving them something to really clinch on so they can really get into that clinch you know and then so sometimes you're worsening their problem with a full arch either soft or hard so in that situation, you go, you can use a partial uh, NTI appliance because it really takes your posterior teeth and your cuspids out of occlusion. Uh, you can try this right now. If you, if you clench on your back teeth, just like you normally bite and really squeeze and clench, you'll find that you can really put a strong clench, you know, feels good. You know, you can really put some pressure on there. But if you go into a protrusive movement, that is you move your teeth out, and put them edge to edge, your front teeth, and try to clench in that position, and you find out you know, it's not as comfortable. It's, you know, it's hard to do. You can't do it very well. 
So that's kind of what the NTI is doing because it's taking advantage of what we call a jaw jerk reflex. So if you've ever had the occasion where you might have bitten on a bone or something on your front teeth or a fork, you accidentally bite and you bit on your front teeth, your jaws will snap open so fast, it will it'll take your breath away. Same thing, kind of like a knee reflex. And we have that built in, it's a protective re reflex that we have that we, so we don't break our front teeth. So that NTI is actually taking advantage of that reflex to some degree. So it, it takes the fun out of clinching. So it's a nice night guard to use for myofuncial, uh, for, for static clinchers or people that have muscle problems. Not as, not as good for joints. All right, the next question going on real fast here. Uh, discuss poor oral hygiene versus altered passive eruption in teenagers. Um, Passive eruption was described by Gottlieb and Orban. They are very old periodontists. We're talking about caveman days. Um, but they described uh, passive eruption. In stage one, your junctional epithelium is actually on enamel. So if you think about it, when, when our teeth erupt, they don't, you know, and we're, we're young, we're in mixed dentition stage, our teeth erupt through the gum tissue, they don't erupt like a stalk of corn growing. Our teeth actually grow kind of like a banana that unpeels. So as our teeth erupt, our gum tissue begins to peel away from that tooth. So your first thing that comes through is enamel. So you have a reduced enamel epithelium and that slowly peels away. So in stage one uh, passive eruption, the junctional epithelium is actually all attached to enamel. Later on, as we kind of complete growth, we're getting into the being a full grown. That's usually around 18 for females, 21 for males as, a, as just a general rule, not, not specific. Your junctional epithelium or the base of the sulcal uh, actually move right to the CEJ. So that's still a healthy situation. But if you look at a, a, a young adult, a college age or around that age they've got long teeth you know and they got real nice looking long teeth and that's that's stage two and that's normal after that we have migration of the epithelium down onto root surface now we're starting to get into more pathological conditions so early stage stage three would be a very say mild periodontitis or a gingivitis and then that's absolutely at stage four, it's all on the root surface. And now you got recession or, or periodontitis. So we're really in a hyperplasia case, especially in teenagers. You got to think about this. We're really in a stage one scenario. We still have epithelial attachment to the enamel of the teeth. So teenagers have short teeth their teeth are not fully erupted. So what we sometimes called altered passive eruption is actually just stage one passive eruption. It's not altered. And so looking at this case, if we look between nine and 10, you'll see there's definitely gingivitis. There's erythematous, you know, it's erythematous. It's maybe a little bit swollen, but you don't really wouldn't call that hyperplasia at that point. You can obviously see this person is not a plaque athlete. You can look at the plaque and see it all over the place. You look at the papilla between seven and eight. It's edematous, it's swollen, but I, would, but I wouldn't say maybe a touch of hyperplasia, but not really. It, it's really more from swelling, inflammatory swelling in that area. But obviously between eight and nine, you have some hyperplasia at this point. But I wouldn't tell you that it's plaque induced. What's really happening is that's from orthodontic pressure on the papilla. So think of your papilla kind of like a rubber band. And as they squeeze those teeth together, that rubber band's going to spread somewhere and it spreads out to the buccal and lingual. And so now you have this very bulbous papilla. It certainly can be aggravated by plaque, but it's really not totally produced by, by, by a response to plaque. So it's just aggravated, but that might be a, a stage one passive eruption that's just aggravated by plaque. So let's go to the next case. The case on the left, there's hyperplasia. 
no doubt about it. I would even call it alternated pa alt altered passive eruption because it's obviously some pathology involved in there. But yeah, you know, not too much plaque laying around, maybe a little bit. No, you know, teenagers there, and especially teenagers with all those plaque traps in there are not necessarily the most um, efficient at, at plaque removal. But, but I would submit to you that this is more orthodontic pressure being applied here than it is a plaque response. Typically, the only time I would do surgery on that is if the orthodontist asked me to, there, this tissue's interfering with my bracket placement or treatment, and maybe I need to get rid of it during surgery. Usually I try to wait till that patient is out of brackets for at least three months and then come back and reevaluate them like this patient on the right. These are not the same patients, by the way. But you can still see there's still some hyperplasia in this. It's not necessarily plaque and redu uh, induced. You can kind of see they, they have pretty reasonably good oral hygiene there. Uh, this is, this again is just a subject, uh, it's fibrosed, and so at that point I would remove it. If this patient was 25 years old, I would tell you that's altered passive eruption. They ought to have longer teeth by now. But in a 13 or 14, 15 year old, this, other than just the, the papilla being misshapen there, this is actually a, a pretty normal length tooth for a teenager. So some of that's not attributable to oral hygiene. So, that brings me back to uh, any questions that you might have. Remember to enter them into the chat if you have a question about that. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Wynn here and let him move right on into our next uh, topics here. All right. Well, it doesn't look like we have any uh, uh, questions. You know, if everyone's being a little shy or not paying attention, whatever it is. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, if you have any questions, again, put them in the chat. We do have some, we will have a Q&A at the end. Uh, if we have time uh, and uh, there were some late submissions to questions so we can go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. I know you're paying attention. Uh, uh, there were some late submissions to the uh, for to the survey so we can we have some that we can hit at the end. OK, so. All right. That was my way of uh, just testing you all there. OK, here you go. So. A question, that, a question that was asked was how can you discuss bacterial involvement in periodontal disease? So I'm surprised that was even asked because, you know, that was the worst thing that we had to study in residency, knowing uh, bacteria. But here we go. I'll, I'll stay pretty basic on it. Um, but essentially in this case here, you can see that there's health on the left and there's uh, periodontal disease on the right. So the way that, ha that periodontal disease or gingivitis or periodontal disease happens in the first place is that bacteria accumulates in that pocket and it attaches to uh, the root and it causes a, a, an inflammatory response by the body. Okay, because when they see the bacteria, they'll send, they'll send all sorts of cells to try to get rid of that bacteria, which causes the inflammation in the area. When it gets severe, when you have more periodontal disease, you start to have bone loss because that's the body's response to trying to distance, social distance itself away from the bacteria. So the body is trying to social distance itself, COVID term, uh, from, uh, from the bacteria. So uh, what happens is that uh, the body can't, it just, it, it continues to have an inflammatory response. You start losing more bone, and eventually you have a deep pocket. And you can see that the, cal the calculus on the side of the root, that is calcified bacteria. So there are different, there are different uh, types of bacteria that, that, go, that attach to the, that go into the pocket and colonize. And that's what I'm gonna touch on here. So the, the bacteria, when they, when, they, when they group up, they, they make a community and they protect each other, essentially. They create this mesh work of different bacteria and each one has a different role. Uh, and some some are just some of the roles are just to attach to the root. Some of them are to cause damage to the tissue, and eventually you have this 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 big you know cesspool of, of bacteria in your pocket. All right, so so Kransky is is really the big name in 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 uh, periodontal disease uh, when it comes to bacteria. So he created this little image here, this pyramid, and the bottom of the pyramid essentially is is um, the early colonizers. So I'm going to focus more on these yellow, orange, and red. Okay, I'm not going to worry about this greenish and blue, um, but 
the yellow colonizers are are mostly streptococcus uh, uh, bacteria. They are gram positive, so they're they're present all the time, you know, in in the body, and they'll attach to the they'll attach to the root, and they'll act as a basic they'll they'll act as the foundation for the rest of the bacteria. The orange complex, which consists of all those bacteria, there I'm not going to go through them all, but they attach to the yellow complex, and they act they form the bridge. They form the bridge between the yellow complex bacteria and the red complex, which are the bad ones. Those are your those are your worst ones, and those are what's causing a lot of your periodontal disease, especially in the subgingival in the subgingival areas. So those the red complex, uh, the three red complex bacteria are P. gingivalis, T. denicola, and T. forsythia. Okay, they each they all have factors and qualities that will create a uh, create problems. Okay, they're either going to start killing bacteria, uh, killing uh, host cells they're going to start invading into tissue uh, ct for scythia has proteases which break down which break down just proteins okay and they they, they kill cells so they're, they're going to be your black pigmented bacteria which dr hale talked about how the nap the laser the ndag laser it attacks the black black pigmentation okay so that's that's why that lanap works really well is that they attack some of these some of these bacteria that are that it will absorb the laser energy. So those are the three that are really causing the problems. And they're always in the base of the pocket, so they're hiding in there. Um, and that's really all I want to touch on as far as bacteria, because it can get very convoluted and probably a lot more than than you really want to know. OK, so this is not a question, but they want to learn more about bisphosphonates, which is great because because bisphosphonates ha do have a dental uh, dental implication. Um, so, so uh, bisphosphonates are used used mostly uh, for two reasons. The most common reason is for osteoporosis. Um, you, patients usually see this in are in middle aged uh, women, postmenopausal women, that uh, that their uh, doctor puts them on this medication to prevent a fracture of their bones. Uh, and and the second most the second reason is patients that have breast cancer prevent metastasis of, um, of, of the cancer to their bones. So what bisphosphonates do are uh, they basically reduce the uh, the resorption of the bone. OK, so just a little background when you your bone and really any of your tissues, they go through two processes. They go through breakdown and building. OK, so it's just a, it's a homeostasis it's a balance uh, and it's you don't really you can't really tell that that's happening but in in bone you have what we call osteoblasts with the b and osteoclast with the c so osteoblasts are bone building uh, cells and osteoclasts with the c are bone destroying cells so what phos what fosamax which is a bisphosphonate uh, which they what do they do is that they reduce the function of the osteoclast with the c so that there's less breakdown of bone. Okay. Now the downside of, of bisphosphonate, which is great for patients that are high risk of breaking, you know, bone fracture, but the biggest downside and dental related downside of, of uh, bisphosphonates are something called osteonecrosis of the jaw. So you can see that on the bottom right picture there. You see that there there's bone exposed here. There was trauma for this patient. She had, I think, bitten into a chip or something along those lines, and it reduces the way that she heals. Now, most of the times, uh, osteoporosis of the jaw happens after an extraction or a surgical procedure, and there's just poor wound healing and bone exposure. Uh, and they're very hard. It's very. It takes a long time to treat these patients, and it's not easy. It's it's it, it's a very long healing process because bone heals pretty slow. Okay. Now, the other thing that the other uh, important factor of bisphosphonates is their half-life. Uh, what their ha what half-life is in regards to pharmacology and medicines is is how how long it takes for there to be only half of what was presented. So now if you have 10 units, I'm just saying units, make it easy, a fossil, 100 units of Fosamax, okay? A half-life is how long it takes to become 50 units of Fosamax. So for Fosamax of bisphosphonate, it takes 10 years, which is a really, really long time. 
essentially what that means is that that patient's going to have Fosamax in their in their body pretty much forever. Okay, so so that's that's pretty important. So what I want to talk about now is the different types of phos uh, bisphosphonates. So when when you do look at their medical history, you know, you know what um, you know what you're looking at. All right. So most most bisphosphonates end in the uh, have the ending dronate. Okay, the dronate right here. There are, are three major oral bisphosphonates. There's Fosamax, Actinel, and Bonivia. Um, the big IV bisphosphonate is Reclast. Now, the big difference between those two are one is frequency of, of taking the medication. Uh, oral bisphosphonates are usually taken about once a week, and IV bisphosphonates are usually done about once a month. And as far as risk for osteonecrosis of the jaw, oral oral is oral uh, bisphosphonates are pretty low. So after surgery, you know, you, you it's less than a percent. So for pretty low, but it can happen. OK, and then we always inform our patients that are on bisphosphonates that this can happen after proceed after procedure. Now for IV uh, bisphosphonates, it's a lot higher. It's it, it's a pretty large range, about four to ten percent. So it's a lot higher risk. OK, now the other thing that that the other class of medication that's very similar is uh, our is a rank L inhibitor. Okay, now that's called the biggest. The one that you may run into is called Prolia. They work a little different than bisphosphonates, but they basically do the same thing. So you can see on the, if you really want to know about it, the diagram is right there, a little cartoon. But in the end, they both reduce osteoclast function. Okay. All right. So that's that's the kind of the the skinny on the on the bisphosphonates. So. Um, uh, what I want to, uh, what, well, let me, well, I'll go back to the question in a second. I'll go at the end of the section. So here's a COVID question. So, so I want to ask, will this new normal be permanent? And what are your protocols in regards to implementing, uh, what, in, what protocols are you implementing in regards to COVID? So uh, short answer is I have no idea uh, what is going on, uh, what we're going to do about this uh, new normal. Um, uh, I, if I had to guess, it's going to be a little while that we're going to have. It's going to be a while before we go back, if we go back to um, what we were doing pre-COVID. So, um, you know, you don't do this. Don't do what this guy does. You know, don't take a, a gummy bear package and make it into a shield. You know, if you want to, I'll take the gummy bears. So those, those are my favorite. But um, but you're, you're, you're going to be wearing shields for a little while. OK, I think in my opinion. It's going to we're going to be doing this for a little while, uh, but in general, dental offices are very safe and um, and, you know, I would say we're probably one of the safest workplaces, you know, aside from maybe a hospital surgical suite. So, you know, we have we have governing bodies that 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 we have to respond to, such as OSHA and uh, uh, we have, you know, sterilization procedures. We have uh, procedures to clean rooms. So in dental offices, I would say we're we're fairly safe, um, you know, in this in during this time, you know, and I think, you know, that's something that, you know, you've got to trust in. Um, but as far as if we're going to change, I I mean, their history can kind of speak for itself because, you know, I wasn't around during this time. But when HIV happened, that's when people's had that's when gloves started to become mandated. You know, but remember, just keep in mind that dentistry didn't at one point there was no masks, no gloves. And, you know, it sounds disgusting right now because it is, you know, but, uh, you know, that that those those were implemented because of uh, health issues. OK, health, you know, things like like HIV and COVID is probably the next the next step on the line. So if if we're required to wear shields or or N95, KN95 mask, you know, that may be, that may be what, that may be what it's going to. I can I hope not personally, because I'm not a fan of the N95, KN95 mask, but, you know, it's, it's, it's to be seen. And they pay people, well, I think they pay people, you know, to, to figure those things out, not me. So we're going to have to keep our, we're going to have to keep, um, you know, an eye on that. So what are we doing? OK, so I think most of y'all are probably doing what we're doing, but 
we do appointment reminders uh, and we make sure we pre-screen them. So if they're having before their appointment, before they even show up to our office, hopefully there we, we give them a little message. You know, if you're having symptoms or if you're if you had contact with somebody, then don't come to our office um, reschedule. You know, this is mandated now, but we get masks. We have to require masks for all the people that come into our practice. Um, and uh, you know, we, we take the temperature of everyone who walks through the door, uh, including ourselves. We actually take our temperatures twice a day, morning and at lunchtime. Uh, and uh, we do a COVID questionnaire for all everyone new that comes in and we update them every time, uh, every time they, they come in for post-operative procedures. Uh, we reduced the amount of people that enter the waiting room. We, we, we rearranged our waiting room, removed some chairs so that people are social distance within the waiting room. And we, we try not to, we encourage people not to bring people unless they need somebody like a driver for sedation and such. such. Uh, you know, PPE, we, we did, we were, this is not, we don't have any changes to PPE. You know, we did add face shields for everybody. And, um, you know, and we do the N95, KN95 masks. And, you know, now that in consults or, or follow ups, we do wear masks when we talk to patients, even though it's, you know, even before we didn't do that. Uh, disposable gowns, we did that already. So that this is not, that's not new for us as a surgical practice. Um, and, you know, we do that, like as Dr. Hill mentioned, we do the hydrogen peroxide rinse. So it's, uh, these, are, these are all probably the things that we're, you're doing. So hopefully, um, I don't think there's anything new. Oh, we actually just added some extra oral suctions that just came in yesterday, I think. So I haven't used it yet, but you know, hopefully it, uh, I heard they're very loud and, uh, but, but we're, we're still experimenting with that. So reduce the aerosol that's coming out because we use the, we use a, a piezo a lot. So we produce a lot of aerosol. So that's supposed to help us there. Okay. Uh, here's a question here. Who needs pre-medication prior to dental treatment? So this is antibiotic uh, prophylaxis. Um, it, it boils down to really two types of patients. Patients that have had total joint replacement, uh, whether it's hip, knee, shoulder, whatever it is, or uh, patients at high risk for infective endocarditis. So what infective endocarditis is, is, is essentially a infection caused by bacteria that gets um, lodged in the, uh, in the valves, the valves or in the heart um, due from the bloodstream. So, so you can read all this. I mean, but essentially, um, uh, uh, the other these are the two kind of categories that we we're looking at. Uh, most of them are going to be joint replacement patients, um, and uh, between the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the ADA, they've come to consensus that uh, within two years of the joint replacement, you, they should have antibiotic prophylaxis. Outside of two years, barring you know no infection, then you know they're they're probably they probably don't need it. Okay, but if they're for me, if their orthopedic surgeon wants them on it, I'm not going to argue with them. So they'll I'll, I'll defer it to them sometimes. Um, what dental procedures need to be covered? Well, it's really it's really anything that involves manipulation of the gum tissue or um, or perforating the oral mucosa. So essentially everything essentially everything. So whether you're probing uh, at initial exam or you're doing a scale and root planning or doing a prophy, they need to be, if they need pre-medication, they need to be pre-medicated for those procedures. Okay, so uh, it boils down to really two types of medications we give if they're allergic or not allergic to penicillin. If they're not allergic, we'll give them two grams of amoxicillin one hour prior to the procedure for them to take one hour prior to the procedure. And if they are allergic to penicillin, we'll give them 600 milligrams of clindamycin, same thing, one hour prior to the procedure. Um, and th these are patients you need to know about, you know, because you, you, they, you may de you probably deal with them on a regular basis. Okay. And uh, another one here is about blood pressure. When do you refuse patients treatment due to blood pressure? Uh, this, one's, this one's a little tough, okay, because it's not, I don't think it's a one size fits all I don't think it's a one size fit all. OK, I think a lot of it depends on what you're doing and how long they're going to be in your chair. Um, many things. So 
on the right here is I'm not going to go through it, but it's the new blood pressure categories. This the newest being in 2017. It's a little more. It's a lot more strict than the old blood pressure categories. So, you know, a higher number may mean worse things, which I mean, is fine. I mean, I think people need to be aware of their blood pressure. But if if they're if I'm doing a surgical procedure that's going to be about an hour, hour and a half or more, then their diastolic. What I taught was taught is if their diastolic is about a hunt is above a hundred, then that needs that's a kind of a red flag. Um, so at that point, I'll let him sit in the chair, lay him back, let him calm down. They may have ran up stairs or whatever it was, and see if their blood pressure goes down. If it goes down into the 90s for their diastolic, then I'll pro I'll I'll go ahead and continue. It also again, it also depends on what we're doing, how much epinephrine, how much local anesthesia with epinephrine I'm going to give them. Um, and, um, you know, if it's a consultation and they're above 100, I mean, it depends on how above 100, but if they're at 100 diastolic, then, you know, we'll proceed with that. But every time it's high like that, I'm telling them to, they need to go talk to their doctor because it's our job as health professionals to um, to make them aware of that and to be not just out just not in their mouth not just talking about the teeth but they we need to talk to them about their overall health too but if they're over 120 diastolic i'm sending them to the i'm telling them they need to get out of the office and go to the er okay because that's not healthy even i don't care how how fast or how hard you ran up the stairs that's not healthy so so th that's that's kind of what that's kind of that's kind of what my guidelines not really a great guideline but those are, that's what i kind of go by um uh, from from my practice. Okay. Okay. Hey, that's the end of my that's the end of my section. But we do have some questions. See, I, I've I've kind of prompted more questions. So um, uh, let's see. Uh, Myra says, how often you order bacterial profile on my patients? I don't do. I don't do that. Um, when it's all said and done, in my opinion, in my opinion, when it's all said and done, I'm whether the bacteria comes back as red complex or yellow complex or whatever it is, I'm treating them the same way. I'm going to do debridement. If it requires surgery, I'm going to do surgery. So it's not going to it's not going to change how um, I, I practice. Now, something that we've looked in, we're starting to look into a little bit is, uh, is people with refractory uh, periodontitis patients that have been treated that are starting to have peri um, deeper pockets again. And, and we're looking at uh, using a microscope and bacteria in those situations, um, but as of now, you know, I don't do any. I don't do any bacterial profiling. Okay. What about you, Doctor Hale? You, you. I, I used to, uh, you know, early on, but I, like just like you pointed out, what I <clears throat> normally got the same. It didn't matter. So you treat them like, like you would if they were all positive, and they. Even if I was doing DNA tests, don't give you any sensitivity to antibiotics. Even when I was doing actual cultural uh, cultures of bacteria, it always came back and recommended amoxicillin and metronidazole. So, again, I just rather than send off for an expensive bacteriological study of any type, whether it's a DNA probe or actual uh, uh, culture, it, it's kind of, a, I almost came to the conclusion it's kind of a waste of time and money for the patient. So you just, you just assume things and operate from that point forward, just like you, you said. So from a practical standpoint, it really doesn't change how I treat that patient. I think it's hard to, anytime I, you know, anytime I, we have to stick like a little piece of paper inside a pocket, I think it's going to be very hard to, uh, very hard to culture back. I think culturing bacteria itself is already difficult enough to do accurately. But point is, we don't really do it because we just treat them. We're going to treat them the same way anyway. Um, so another, we got another one here. So Susan asked, in regards to COVID-19, how are you treating the turnover of treatment rooms? Do you let the room sit empty for a designated amount of time before using the same room again? So yes, yeah. um, we we have enough rooms where we can work around that. You know, we don't we don't see we don't see the large volume of patients like you would maybe in a general practice uh, general practitioner's office. Uh, but so we have that ability to do that. Uh, of course, we're going to wipe it down, you know, top to bottom as best you know the best we can. Um, well, and I say we, it's not me. But I know they do, and uh, but they but we do leave it we do leave it uh, as long as we can um, before we we use it for another procedure. 
Is and our, our hygienists have actually been rotating rooms. That's right. But, I mean, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Hey, I appreciate we appreciate the questions. Keep them coming. OK, we got one little section here. Uh, Dr. Hale is going to take over uh, at this time. Okay. Uh, and all right. Uh, all right. We'll Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Wynn. We're good. Yeah, you can yep. share your screen. Yeah. When and how do you treat recession and how do you determine if a patient will benefit from grafting and including uh, a discussion about pinhole and tunneling procedures? Um, so when do you treat recession? Well, I, I look for certain things. Uh, first off, chronic marginal inflammation. Is it healthy? You know, I ask it, you know, do okay, we have adequate? Sorry, I got, I got to interrupt uh, you real quick. You're not, yeah. uh, can you share your screen? Yeah, I thought, let me see. Yeah, I'm still on my screen here, so. Yeah, you still on it? Okay, yeah. let me, let me go back. And uh, Lori, I all didn't right. miss you, okay? I know you missed okay. your Cavitron and, you know, you worked without gloves and all that. And, you know, that's, I'm glad you're working with gloves now because that's, that's not, yeah. that's yeah. close. I, I, don't think you're, I don't think you're sharing yet, so let's oh, try again. Okay. Let's try again. Sorry. <laughs> How about now? No, I don't. I don't see it yet. I can flip through it for you if you want. Yeah, go ahead. Let me. Let me. Yeah, let me get it right. All right. I put share on it. Okay. There how about go. how about there, now okay yeah there you go mike has to teach me how to do all this stuff here <laughs> uh when do you treat recession uh chronic marginal inflammation is it healthy do you have adequate keratinized attached gingiva so those are some things we look for uh sensitivity to various stimulants so if the patient's complaining about hot cold or sweets or if you can scratch your explorer across the exposed route and the patient reacts to that, that may be some indication for treatment. Um, if you're planning restorations near the gingival margin, so in this case where they were talking about maybe putting some composite resin down on the root surfaces and cover that up, the patient comes ask and said, oh, well, maybe we can put what God gave you originally and put some gum back on their teeth and you can see the result from that. Uh, so, so we can do some things, and if you can't cover it all the way up, then there might be where we'll, we'll meet in the middle, and maybe that's when there's some indications to put some restorations, or we're putting veneers on teeth and things like that. Cosmetic issues, patient just comes in and says, I don't like the way my teeth look. I, I want that covered up. Can we cover it? Yep, probably could. Our, the hardest one for us is progression because, you know, we get a patient referred in for recession, and we've seen that patient for five minutes, whereas you have the opportunity to see them for a much longer period of time a lot of times. And so if you see this kind of movement in the teeth, then, then you can point out to the patient that, you know, or they, they may point it out to you. Hey, I didn't used to see this. What What's going on? And it's not a, oh, let's wait, because what are you waiting for? It's just going to get worse. So really, when do I treat recession? I ask six questions to myself. Is it healthy? Is there enough attached gingiva? Is it sensitive to hot or cold, sweets or probing? Restorations near the gingival margin? Cosmetic issues? And lastly, is it progressive? So I kind of roll through these questions on to myself and then and, and answer when do I treat it? And sometimes, you know, I look at a patient and say, well, if it's not bothering you, leave it alone. You know, whatever you want to do. So how do you treat it? And I have several options. We've got free grafts. You know, we could take tissue from the palate. From the palate. You could take it at a full thickness. That is, you leave epithelium in place. Uh, you can do it subepithelial. So you go down below that and take a wedge of tissue out for it, but you actually leave the epithelium intact in the palate. And then you have uh, dermal allograft materials, that, which are basically just reconstituted or freeze-dried collagens. So we're going to take a look at some of that. You could do positional flaps. So you can move it up, down, sideways, obliquely, you know, move it, uh, move it together. So there's a lot of variety of different uh, 
flap techniques you can use to, to treat recession. And then uh, specifically, y'all had asked about tunnel procedures. There's the pinhole technique. That's Dr. Chow's technique. He actually uses a 16 gauge needle and kind of gouges out what he calls a pinhole um, versus a VISTA approach, which is a vertical incision for subperiosteal tunneling approach. That's a, you can use a scalpel and make a, a pinhole, just like a pinhole. Uh, it's been around for a very long time. And then lastly, uh, uh, an intracellular. You don't make any pinholes. You just kind of go through the crystal marginal gingiva that way. That, that uh, Pat Allen in Dallas is a, a big proponent of that. And in reality, what I really do on a day-to-day -day basis is just combinations of all of that. If you kind of look just at this slide alone and figure out all the permutations that you could come up with to treat it, it there's more than a thousand. I stopped counting it, kind of thinking a thousand different ways to treat it, literally. So it's it's kind of fun. I kind of do it on the fly a lot of times there. So let's talk specifically about tunneling procedures because that was part of the question. You can see on the left there, that's a scalpel making an incision. That's a VISTA approach. But if you tried to do it by Dr. Chow's pinhole technique, it would look exactly like that. So there's no real distinction there. I think I actually prefer making a nice clean incision with a scalpel rather than gouge out a hole with a with a 16 gauge needle which there's not any necessity to it. The reason Dr. Chow does it that way is he can claim that he doesn't actually cut you. So he infers that he's not actually doing surgery on you. Well, in California, that might be a white lie, but in Texas, that's what we make cow patties out of. So, so we, uh, I use a VISTA approach more often. Basically, once you've made that pinhole, you take uh, periosteal elevators and things and just move laterally and, and lift that tissue up off the bone all the way up to the top of the teeth there. Um, basically, you're creating kind of a pouch up underneath there that frees that gum tissue to move up, up and down. You know, you really can cover the recession. If you're doing it strictly by a pinhole on the right side, you see uh, that top corner there, that's biomend. And Biomend is just a sheet of collagen, reconstituted collagen, if you will. So, or um, if you want to, you can use Ceramed, Cerem that's uh, Nobel. I give it a plug in for Joe. You can use their materials, um, but you can use Ceros. So you can pack that in. And what he does, he just takes it through that pinhole and he stuffs it up in there and he overstuffs that like you would a stuffed chair to the point where he lifts that gum tissue up high enough, he actually advocates not putting sutures in there, which is interesting. That's kind of why I went to take his course because I wanted to see how he got away with not placing sutures, but he overstuffs it enough to do that. Um, versus uh, what I normally do, I just take a piece of alloderm. That's a dermal piece of, uh, it's just collagen. It's just a different format of it. So I just push it in up underneath there stuff it in there like I stuff a chair and lift that up. I do use a more of uh, sutures. I like the idea of sutures a little bit because without sutures, you can't eat on it and you can't brush it for up to six weeks with Dr. Chow's technique. So at least with sutures, I have a belt and cinder, uh, suspenders approach to the thing. So you can do it either way. So how do you treat this recession? Let me just do a little quick show you real quick how I do some, uh, let me get a pin up here. Let's say I just want to look at this case. I go through my six questions. I look at it, it looks relatively healthy. Maybe a little bit of inflammation here, but not enough to write home to mom. Uh, you know, lots of keratinized tissue. So, you know, that's not the problem. Not complaining of sensitivity to hot or cold. Doesn't seem to be progressive, but the patient says, I don't really like the way my teeth look. So we're going to fix this for them. So the first approach might be just a simple positional flap, a coronal position. So I'll make a vertical incision. I might use some Zucchelli incisions here. I might use a little papillary incision like this. Uh, go around it, back to Zucchelli, come over here and drop another vertical. 
take a little wedge of tissue out over here. Get this flap very mobile. Once we're into mucosa, I can release that, a periosteal release, and now it moves up. And all I do is coronally position that tissue. I pull it up, put some sutures in it, close it up, and there you go. So that's one way of treating it. Now let's just say I changed my mind. I'd rather do it by uh, a tunneling technique. So I go back over here. Let me go back and get my pin up. So what I'm going to do over here, I'm going to make a little pin hole here, and I might make another pin hole over here. I'm going to tunnel laterally up in between that, raising this tissue up. Eventually, till I get to a point where I've actually even uh, take an instrument sometimes, and I go through the sulcus. But you'll notice we're not cutting any of the papilla. We're leaving all of them intact. And I get that flap again. I get it really loose. And I move it all up. I can stuff anything I want it into, any kind of collagen that I choose. I stuff it up. I can put sutures in it. Or if I was using a strict pinhole, I might not have to use sutures at all. But you see the same approach or a different approach and I can get the same thing done. So it's not the, the, the message I'm taking home is don't get strung out on, oh, you can only use a pinhole or you can use anything. Uh, this is an example of uh, where, for instance, we can use a laterally positioned flap. So we make an incision like this, come down, make a little V, come up here, kind of denude this area, partial thickness, and then I, free this up and I switch it all and I move it all laterally, cover that up, suture it into place. So that's another type of positional flap that you can use. So those are just some examples of what and how you can treat it. You can do it a lot of different ways. No way is right, no way is wrong. So, you know, pick and choose. Uh, periodontal maintenance, 4910. Again, this is one of those uh, insurance questions where I had to really go and uh, talk to my front desk a little bit more about it. But when a patient alternates from a perio office to us, we take bite wings and share them with the periodontal office and would like the periodontist to share their probe chart with us. Do you feel this is an acceptable approach? And I certainly could live with that arrangement. And thanks in, for sharing your radiographs. I appreciate it. Uh, and the patients do too, because they give us a hard time if, if we don't. The bigger question would be, should probing be done at each alternating recall visit? Uh, and yes, but it probably has some limited value to formally record it unless, you know, there's a need. So, you know, it doesn't do you any good to have 400 charts with three millimeter pockets on it. But if you, you see a, a deep pocket developing in Miss Jones, you know, whoa, maybe you ought to, maybe it's time to pull out a probe and do a, you know, a six, you know, six point surface probing, or you get unexpected bleeding, a lot of things like that. Probably a screening probing is more appropriate in most cases. Ourselves, I usually have Jenna do a formal probing chart once a year. And it's shared with your office with a recall report. Now, you know, people miss recalls or we get off a little bit. So I say a year, year and a half. We try to get those probe charts done. I found myself doing too many screening probings at one time. And I, I discovered that, you know, it'd come along and it'd be eight years before I probed somebody all of a sudden because they've been stable and whatever. And I hadn't noticed anything. And But you can't do that. So, so the next part of that question was that it had been recommended in seminars that each office should do their own probing. And I feel that patients don't appreciate that. You know, in some patients it's painful or they think it's painful. And uh, what do you think? And uh, if I feel there's a need for charting, I prefer my own. So I, I somewhat agree with what they're saying in the seminars, at least in principle, I, I, I agree with that. If, you're, if you think or feel the need for a probe chart, then you should do it yourself. Uh, don't depend on my probe chart for everything. Uh, I get a lot of uh, information from probing by tactical, tactile feel. I, 
I could feel calculus or um, I can better calibrate with my own probing style so I can compare better with my old charts to myself. Because, uh, you know, we had a lecture earlier, you know, a couple of years ago about differences in probing and everything and how everybody charts differently. So, so there's some problems with, with uh, interoperative uh, charting. We, you might probe an eight, where I might probe a six or vice versa. Um, I don't mind you sharing your charting with me, but I don't use it for diagnosis and I don't do it for treatment planning. So don't tell your patient that I'm going to, you know, hey, I've already charted you. They won't have to do that. I, I do use it for comparison just to make sure I didn't miss something because sometimes you do see, you know, I look at your chart and I, I look at them and do we generally agree with each other? But uh, hey, you probed an eight on the distal of two and I only probed a four. What What's wrong? I, I that, that lends me to go back and check and sure enough, Maybe I didn't angle my probe right or something and I missed it. So I, I, there's value in sharing charts, but, I, but I'm not totally dependent on your chart. I don't even use my own hygienist probing, you know, really and not that I don't trust Jenna, but our probings are different and uh, I see it all the time. So, so just keep that in mind. When you, when you need a chart, chart. Uh, share it with me. I, I certainly look at them. But, but I'm not going to base my diagnosis or uh, treatment on, on your chart alone. Uh, there's probably some liability issues with doing that anyway. Um, the other part, I'm not sure that patients treated with SRP 4341 or a partial SRP 4342 should forever be on periodontal maintenance 4910. What if a patient presents with good home care and an absence of gingivitis or clinically active periodontitis after You've scaled and replaned them. Should they still be a 4910? So I had to look, uh, you know, and so what's the difference between an 0110 Profi, uh, you know, and a 4910? And the only clinical difference I saw in the actual wording was the word subgingival used with a 4910. Uh, and then obviously all the wording about previously treated for periodontitis. But if you disregarded that, there's only one word difference between them, subgingival. Scaling and root planing implies that you're subgingival. You know, you have to go down below the gum tissue and, and you have to have attachment loss in order to get onto the root. So if you're using that 4341 code, you're treating a periodontitis patient or at least um, uh, I mean, maybe in some severe recession cases that might be an exception, but but by and large, you have to have some degree of periodontitis either present or in the past, uh, even stage one. And that's, you know, very mild periodontitis. And after that, it's always and forever a periodontal patient. Stage three patient, for instance, one that's more severe, four to six millimeters and has some furcations, maybe even lost a tooth. Even though I treat them fantastically, I treat them up, um, then uh, despite great healing, you're, you're once a perio patient, you're always a perio patient. I'm, I'm hearing some uh, feedback in there. Someone's got their mic open there. That being said, insurance companies play by their own rules. So you see the fine print. If they play games, you play games. You know, you, you have to kind of do play by their rules if they're going to play those kind of games. One back but, on my. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dr. Hale, you're muted, I think. Dr. Hale, yeah. You have to mute, unmute on the, on the software. Joe, can you unmute Dr. Hale? I think. Oh, there you go. There you go. Right there. How about there?
That's Where'd good. we go? Okay. Uh, I don't know where we left, but uh, that being said, it. yeah. Hey, Ashley, you need to mute yourself. Please. Yeah. yeah. That being said, uh, insurance companies play by their own rules. See the fine print. If they play games, you play games. And our po um, this, this disease doesn't care what insurance pays. And, you know, and so you treat your, your patients as you see fit and try to maximize their benefits legally. So let's talk about implant hygiene. I'm still, uh, somebody's still un, uh, not, uh, un, not muted there. What are the basic instruments for cleaning implants? And can I use an ultrasonic scaler on the implant? Oh my goodness, you know, it's an implant and you're fearing the scratch, you know, and they've got all kinds of special instruments. We've talked about them before. Graphite, plastic, plastic or uh, inserts on your ultrasonics, titanium, and God forbid if you used a metal probe when you probe it. But uh, implant hygiene is relatively just like teeth, you know, use a bass technique, any kind of toothpaste. Floss with emphasis on, uh, you know, flossing underneath to get, get to that contour and make sure that you get underneath that uh, crown and, and, and uh, clean it up. Pocket irrigators, you can, you can dip super floss in chlorhexidine or hydrogen peroxide, whatever you want to use. Um, but that's the way normally with hygiene. Uh, a little interesting thing, I, I tried it out. Uh, these Philip Sonics air flossers, you know, if you haven't tried one, they're kind of funny. It's got a little reservoir. You fill up your favorite uh, mouth rinse in it and then hit a little button in it three times, you know, psh, 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 shoots three little deals of air. And I kind of thought that might be a good way to clean up under an implant too. So that's another idea. Messy on your mirror though, golly, you know. Um, remember, Implants are different than teeth. Uh, teeth have a, a connective tissue connect, uh, attachment by Sharpie's fibers and junctional epithelium, where an implant, you can't attach to the metal, so you have some real tightly constricting uh, circular fibers and mostly junctional epithelium. So, you know, if you're probing around an implant and it's resistant to your probe and it doesn't bleed readily or whatever, just leave it alone. Uh, you know, you're better off not disturbing the at attachment on there. Um, but let's say we have a perimucositis. That's the equivalent of a, like a gingivitis around a tooth. So it bleeds on probing, but you look at an x-ray and there's no bone loss. And most of our modern implants that we're using nowadays are bone level. We use a bone level implant from uh, from Nobel. So, uh, with that, you can use a, I, I don't feel like there's any harm in using an ultrasonic scaler because you're not going to be able to reach the implant anyway. Uh, you know, very little risk to the actual implant itself. You're going to have some risk to the crown and the abutment. So, you know, you use the same rules you do on a tooth, probe it, keep it, you know, keep moving and uh, be gentle when you're doing it. COVID's kind of taken care of your ultrasonic scaler on a temporary basis, I hope, and uh, maybe these uh, extra oral suctions that we brought in might might improve that scenario for us in the near future. I'm praying for you. I, I feel your pain. Um, irrigate with, um, this was uh, suggested out of uh, New York, um, University of New York. Uh, you, enter, you can irrigate with a 0.005 or a 0.006 solution of sodium hypochloride. That's Clorox bleach, nine parts water to one part bleach. And oddly enough, President Trump was correct when he talked about Clorox bleach being a, a, a micro antimicrobial. But this this is what he was talking about. Not not don't use full Clorox bleach out of a bottle. It'll burn you. You could consider arresting. But uh, the other thing is you might need anesthesia to do this because patients don't really like you digging up underneath their implants. It's kind of tied up underneath there. And if it happens to be a screw retained restoration or a two piece abutment. If you could talk your dentist into removing the crown or the abutment and let you work on it, it's a whole lot easier to work on that. And you can disinfect it much more effectively as well. It's actually advocated, so something to consider. 
more severe peri-implantitis, not bleed zone probing, purulence, but now you have bone loss associated with it. So this is a close-up of a, an implant. Um, uh, and as you can tell, that implant surface is not particularly smooth. So if you think using your ultrasonic scaler on this is going to scratch it anymore or make it any more rough, then you're probably just fooling yourself, really. Actually, uh, there's a study by Lindy and his group, very prominent periodontist, that shows that if you're using a scaler against an implant in this scenario, if you use it in kind of a smoothing fashion, it may actually improve healing around this type of implant. So you might even do some good if you use the ultrasonic in a correct, let's say a piezo in a, you know, in a, in a parallel fashion to the root surface, you might actually improve healing. Again, you could use your sodium hypochlorite. You might be better off removing the crown to treat this if you have to and need anesthesia. But the reality of it, the prognosis on this particular implant is extremely poor, 50-50 or less, and that's even with the best we have to offer you. So it might be better just to refer it and get it out of your office. Your, your doctor will be glad and we'll be sad. So anyway, uh, that's something to, to consider. Hand instruments. Someone asked, do I use hand scalers and curettes? And what are your favorite instruments? I don't know that it makes much difference, but I do use hand instruments when I need to, especially on isolated deep pockets on anterior maxillary teeth. They tend to be easier to scale and root plane effectively. Um, otherwise, I, I really don't use them often, quite frankly. I, I've given up on them. Not totally, but but to somewhat. So, so what I do, I do my own scaling and root planings. I don't, I don't use my hygienist to do that. I use a piezo ultrasonic scaler or a high-speed hand piece sometimes if the calculus is really tenacious. And uh, occasionally, I, I will use specific hand curettes. I do one half mouth appointments for about an hour, and I do it with local anesthetic. I don't really think you can do adequate scaling and root planning without anesthesia. I just can't do it. I usually place them on antibiotics. It's usually an amoxicillin and metronidazole to answer your question back on the bacterial load portion of the deal. I usually keep it on there for a week and I try to get the patient to do both of those appointments within the week that I have them on the antibiotics because uh, trying to get what I call a one-two punch there, you know, and try to get that. It's not a showstopper if they can't do it. Oh, I can't come in. Well, it's a, it's, it's a good thing to do. It's not quintessential. Um, and I actually do, I only really scale and replane patients when I think it's going to be definitive treatment. Uh, so it's a non-surgical case. I don't think I'm going to need to do surgery. So that, that's, I kind of limit it to that, that type of uh, patient. Um, my favorite instrument's a sharp one. I don't care what, which one you pick, but I want it sharp. So you need to pay attention to your angles, 70 degrees on curettes and 90 degrees on scalers, you know, and that's, that's what you do. My personal choices, same one I was trained with the residency, and this is what I, I use. I use a Gracie one, two for anterior. Younger good five, six curette for bicuspids. It's kind of heavy shanked and it's just a right curvature for a bicuspid. Younger good seven, eight. I use it. It is a universal scaler. I use it for a lot more things than scaling. Uh, but it's, but I, I actually, it's so big. It's kind of hard to really use as a, as a scaler per se. Gracie 11, 12 for mesial posteriors. A Columbia 1314 scaler, which is really kind of my favorite instrument in the posterior region. It's a universal scaler and its own posterior teeth. And then a Gracie 1314 for distals of posterior teeth, which I'm not very good at doing. And that's why I use a lot of piezos. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to the questions. And uh, Dr. Wynn will take over from here and we'll kind of finish up this night and and uh, get ready for tomorrow. And uh, yeah. thank well, you very much for coming. Yeah, yes. yeah. We got a few minutes. So there were some late submissions to the uh, survey for the questions. So we'll see if we can hit a few before we get out of here. We'll spend more than five minutes on it. Um, 
But uh, the thing, uh, one of this is, what is your pet peeve when it comes to things that general dentists refer to your practice that is really not really in the scope of your expertise? In other words, you, you see the patient, you say to yourself, why do they send you to me? So you want to take this one? Well, uh, it really, there, there's no particular pet peeve that I have. If you send me a patient, I'm so doggone appreciative I got it from <laughs> you. I don't, I don't worry about why you sent it there. I figure you had, you know, you had some rationale, you had some question to answer it. If it's, if you just by accident rerouted it to some place where, you know, hey, it wasn't me that really needed to be treating. I don't mind referring it on. Usually, I'll call you and tell you, hey. Um, I, I looked at Miss Jones, and Miss Jones really needs to have an endo evaluation. So uh, I might send them to, you know, to our, you know, Dr. Garza, Campbell, or Hijik, or whomever. And um, so, so really, there's no patient that I'm disappointed that you sent to me. I, I, I just can't, I can't think of a scenario that you did, you did something wrong. Yeah, and I, I would, yeah. I never would want you to feel that way at all. So yeah. I'm, send, I'm in, send anything and everything you want to send. I'll take it. Yeah, I'm in agreement. I'm, I'm in the same boat. So, yeah, I, I don't think I've ever been like, oh, wh why did this, why is this patient here? Uh, as long as, I mean, I mean, it helps to have a good note on the referral. So we know what, what, you know, what you were asking us in a way. Yeah, I have so, been in a situation where I didn't know why the patient was coming to see me and they don't know half the time either. So yeah, it is a good idea to kind of give us a hint somewhere down the line. Yeah. So the next one we got here is uh, what expectation does a periodontist have of the hygienist? So uh, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, you know, it, as far as between whether it's our own, whether it's Jenna, our own hygienist, Jenna Renee, our own hygienist, or um, or y'all, I mean, really, it's just to be, in my opinion, to be a monitor for periodontal disease and to really reinforce what we say. So, so uh, when we do surgery on a patient and we start doing alternating maintenance, you know, we always tell them, you know, to brush their gums because they're already at high risk for periodontal disease. Um, and, you know, brush gums, floss, use proxy brushes, all those sorts of things. And, you know, just reinforcement of that message as well as just monitoring for uh, potential breakdown you know that you know we want you to like be the police the police the deputies of uh, periodontal disease if you will um so you know that's that's my that's really my expectation anything you have to add Andrea? no i i think as long as you're reinforcing oral hygiene uh, oral hygiene oral hygiene oral hygiene and no smoking that's that's what I want to hear you tell them every time. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, this was not quite a question, but it's a. I guess it is a question. Is it pseudo pockets? Are they real or an excuse to watch? What do you think? <laughs> uh, they're real. Uh, you know anything? You know, again, it's it's a mechanical issue, really. Anything above a three millimeter probing depth, and you know the the patient can't adequately. Uh, self-clean that that particular pocket or sulcus now if it's if it happens to be stage one passive eruption and then, you know you can't probe past three millimeters well it, it might not be a problem yet and it it could eventually become a problem but it but if it does probe you know greater than three millimeters then you know, a lot of times you see it around second molars, maxillary second molars and first molars, and that's actually a very easy correction surgically. And in fact, it makes me look like a really good periodontist when I do it, because it's fairly easy to reduce those pockets back there. Uh, actually, you're giving the patient their normal, you know, kind of stage two passive eruption teeth back to them, and, and it's easier for them to clean. So, so I like, I actually like treating it. I when I when I have to so but so yeah it's real yeah I you know those are considered measly tip teeth so they lose their first molars and their second molars start tipping measly you're gonna get somewhat of a deeper pocket probably on the mesial 
it may, you know, it may, those are a little different scenario, but those those are real for sure. You may you may not actually have any attachment loss on that too. Right. You could you could have a deeper pocket but not have attachment loss. So you could cut that tissue back, but it'll rebound back out, you know, over time too. So so that's not always uh, easy to treat. Right. For, on a long term basis. Okay. The so, best way to do it's untip the tooth. All right. We have one last one here. So um, we are having a lot of issues. Uh, with uh, insurance these days not covering scaling and root plane. Can someone help us with parameters and what is needed that we may be missing? So, um, you know, I know we we kind of had we had this discussion quite a bit and scale and root planning is is used a lot. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't say there's there has to be attachment loss because like as Dr. Hale said in the, in the previous uh, questions, root plane needs to be on the root. Uh, so that means there needs to be some attachment loss. So you need to demonstrate that there is attachment loss and not you're just not removing super gingival calculus that's on the enamel. So, you know, a big thing is make sure you just treat the patient. You know, there's a big difference between clinical treatment and insurance treatment. And you really don't ever want to treat based on insurance if you can help it. So, um, you know, that's, you know, sometimes sometimes we need to do treatment that insurance is not going to cover. Uh, to make, you know, to do the right thing for the patient. Anything you want to add there? Well, again, uh, it, it, you, scaling and root planning is, 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 has been traditionally abused or historically abused as a procedure code. And so really, it's kind of been a ruined code. They don't pay well. I don't even care if they cover it and, and say it's okay. You know, they're not going to pay anything anyway. So you you might be better, patient might actually be better off saving their money for the crown that you're going to put on them, you know, or their deductible being used on that. So you can make some arguments one way or the other. But, uh, you know, the other thing I would tell you, you could put a narrative in there explaining your rationale for scaling and root planning. So you're looking for subgingival calculus, furcations, you know, send them x-rays that show that there's furcations that then if you can see the calculus on the x-ray, well, point it out to them. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid to, I've had them turn me down on perio, you know, and I look at them like they're idiots and send x-rays back to them and say, look at this. And really what they're doing, they're just throwing it in their trash. They're not even looking at it because I know that delays that claim for another 30 days or whatever while you get it all back together. So they're playing games. So like I told, like I mentioned before, if they play games, you play you play games back. Point out where they're wrong and they'll they'll listen to you sometimes. Yeah. They're going to they're going to do what they're going to do whether you like it or not, you know. Um, so so that's well, that's my attitude about it. Yeah. I agree. Well, that's it. That's all the questions that we've got. Um, we hope that you benefited somewhat um, through this webinar. You know, hopefully you took away a few things that could help you. Um, if you do have more questions or you want us to answer something, uh, we can, um, you know, you know just send us an email and we can help you. We want to be a resource for y'all. Um, if we find um, those resources for Perio um, education materials, I will either We'll get it posted on the website. Uh, we'll post again. Expect an email in the next few days with your CE credit, your um, your uh, the webinar link. If in case you want to rewatch it, want to rewatch us talk. I mean that's that'd be that's a hoot. Uh, or <laughs> yeah. or uh, you know or um, and also the uh, the powerpoints. We'll send all those to y'all and hopefully um, you know again we appreciate y'all being here. We know this is not ideal how we're doing this, but you know, but we appreciate your patience and all that. Okay. Okay. We'll appreciate it. And um, we will, we'll see you next time. Love you guys. I'll be good. Be careful right. out there. All right. Bye. All right. Bye.